What is up? Welcome back. Uh, this is Noah Hills. You can find me on Twitter at No More Parties. And today I'm doing a little bit of a weird video, probably. Probably the dumbest idea I've maybe ever had. But the bit is I want to talk about some running backs who, like, I normally wouldn't talk about in context that I normally wouldn't talk about them. So I've created this, like, completely contrived situation where I have the randomizer wheel, I have a bunch of running backs on it, a bunch of rookie running backs. I'm gonna spin the wheel, and the randomizer is going to select a top five ranking of running backs in this rookie class. It's gonna create a top five. It's not gonna be my top five, it's not gonna be anybody else is top five, you know, probably, hopefully not. But wherever the randomizer puts those guys, I'm going to have to like find some sort of legitimate justification in their profile, like in their evaluation that would, you know, make it somewhat plausible that like whichever guy could conceivably finish as the RB5 or the RB3 or whatever. A couple rules. The arguments have to be like made in good faith. I can't just say like Damian Pierce is running back one because like running backs don't matter or Kennedy Brooks is running back two because like I was wrong about whatever. Like I have to find like actual positives or negatives relative to how I, you know, would have otherwise thought about them that make it plausible that they would finish it running back X, you know, whatever the, whatever the randomizer chooses. And uh, second rule, I'm not gonna be talking about Isaiah Spiller. I did that in the last video, last two videos, actually, I've talked about him too much. So we don't need to talk about Isaiah Spiller again. I've got another video coming out Wednesday, I believe, where I'm going to touch on like five like really deep sleeper running backs. I remove them from the randomizer. I don't need to double dip on them. And then at the end of kind of each guy I talk about here, I'm going to give like a one to 10 rating of how plausible I think it is that they could finish in this spot. And I guess, I guess the bit is like the randomizer has a time machine. We're like three years down the road and whatever random dude finishes the RB2, whatever other random dude finishes the RB1, like why did that happen? I have to find something in the profile that makes it, you know, make sense why that happened. So, let's do it. In the randomizer for RB5. We're going to start at 5, go to 1. Okay, RB5. My mouse will work. My mouse is working. Yikes. Uh, we got CJ Verdell. CJ Verdell from the University of Oregon. Let's do it. Okay. Three years down the road, CJ Verdell is the RB5 in the 2022 running back class. How did that happen? That happened because CJ Verdell found the form that he showed us when he was a freshman at Oregon. CJ Verdell is like a 5'8, 210 pound dude. So he's like short stout, built like a rock in the same range as like, you know, Maurice Jones, Drew, Ray Rice, Devontae Freeman, Aaron Jones, like these, these short guys who aren't small. They're like built well. They just happen to be short. So, you know, he's, he's rocked up as a freshman. He actually, he redshirted his first year, but as a redshirt freshman, he had over 200 carries over a thousand rushing yards, 27 receptions, 22% dominator rating, which for second year college players is in the 62nd percentile. So he, you know, was really, really productive early on. And, you know, looking back like two, three years ago, like Devi guys were all over CJ Verdell as like a potential top five running back in, you know, if he came out last year, you know, in this year. Since then, kind of went downhill a little bit. Uh, he had a he had a really good year after that. He had right around 200 carries, 1,200 yards that season. Went down a little bit in the receiving department. He only had 14 catches um, as a redshirt sophomore. And his dominator rating dipped down to 17%. So he was more productive, but less productive relative to the Oregon offense. But that season, he was actually more efficient. So as a redshirt freshman, his yards per carry was only 0.03 yards greater than the rest of the guys on the team. So he was basically at the same like per carry output as the other runners at Oregon. As a sophomore, his yards per carry was 0.72 yards higher than theirs, almost a full yard higher. That's in the 58th percentile. His 10 yard run rate jumped from like negative relative to his teammates to a full percentage point higher, which is just above average. It's in the 52nd percentile, but he was an above average runner relative to dudes who get drafted to go to the NFL. So pretty good. A little less productive, more efficient. But then in 2020 and 2021, not great. Uh, his efficiency dipped quite a bit. The past two years, he's been almost a full yard per carry, less efficient than the other guys on his team. Uh, his 10-yard run rate has been 3 and 4% lower than the other duck running backs during those two years, these past two years. And he's he hasn't caught as many passes. He only caught nine passes each season. He hasn't even had 100 carries in either of those seasons. And he's he's been hurt. He's only played, I believe, like five 
games in each season, five to seven games. I, I don't remember exactly, but he hasn't played that much. Uh, he kind of got outdone by this dude, Travis Dye, who I think actually just transferred to USC. But this kid, Travis Dye, ended up taking over the starting running back spot. So Verdell kind of kind of fell in the pecking order, even on that lower volume, hasn't been as efficient. If he's going to end up being the RB5, it'll be because he's the dude we saw early on couple other positives. So I mentioned he's, you know, short and stout, you know, built pretty well. He can catch the ball a little bit. You know, we saw that early on in his career. His catch rate is 81%. That's in the 68th percentile. So he doesn't have a problem like actually securing the football. Yards per target, 8.3, 79th percentile. So just kind of bird's eye view, like he's he's doing a good job as a pass catcher, like being efficient when the when the ball's thrown to him. The case for him at RB5, he's got three down ability, built well, can catch the ball. He puts all these glimpses that we've seen together, you know, rushing efficiency as a sophomore, production as a freshman. He puts him in the same season. He's that dude. And we've seen a guy, you know, kind of have a similar career path and end up being a good player. Like Jamal Williams kind of had an up and down career at BYU, like broke out early, Had a couple down years. I think he was kicked off the team for a year. Came back, was all right. He's been a really solid NFL player. And this is like a weak running back class. Like Jamal Williams, if he was coming out, he could be the RB5 in this class. And CJ Verdell, it's not like completely unreasonable that he could be that guy. So if those things happen, we could be getting peak Verdell. And Peak Verdell is actually pretty nice. In 2018, he had a game against Oregon State where he had 208 yards from scrimmage, five touchdowns. The next season, he had a game against Washington State where he had over 300 yards from scrimmage and three touchdowns. And even just this last year, his final year at Oregon, he had a game against Ohio State where he had 195 yards from scrimmage and three touchdowns. So, like, Peak Verdell can play. So if he's that dude, if he's done, like, dealing with whatever problems he's been dealing with, he could be RB5. The plausibility of that. On a scale of 1 to 10, I'll give it, like, a 3. Like, he was, even when he was more efficient than the guys on his team, he wasn't that efficient. Like, 58th percentile, 52nd percentile in yards per carry, 10-yard run rate. 58th percentile, like, says what it is. That's, like, pretty average. If that's peak Verdell that we're hoping for is pretty average, then... RB5 is going to be like a tough ask. He was never that dominant. That dominator rating, 62nd percentile early on, you know, decent. But, you know, after that, like 31st percentile dominator rating, 24th percentile dominator rating. If he's at his peak, he's like a 60th percentile producer like four years ago. Basically, I think the bottom line is he was a decent college player. He's going to max out, like even if we're getting peak for Dell, he's like a pretty mediocre professional running back. I don't know that he sucks, but peak for Dell is probably pretty average. Okay. Let's go to RB4. See what the uh, the old randomizer has for us here. We got Zonovan Knight from NC State. Okay. Zonovan Knight, the deal with this guy, they call him Bam Knight. I don't know why. Zonovan's kind of a dumb name, so I guess Bam works better. He's like 5'11", 210, so kind of in that like Miles Sanders, Marlon Mack, Tony Pollard range of like slightly below average, but probably big enough. And he, I guess kind of the case for him is he's like fairly well-rounded, doesn't have a whole lot of weaknesses. He actually only spent three years at NC State, so he's going to be an early declare. We like to see that. We like to see our running backs like leave college early. We like to see them leave early because that probably means that the NFL wanted them to leave early. So if the selection committee or whatever the fuck it is for the combine or the draft selection process was telling him him like you're not going to get drafted he'd probably be going back to school but he's coming out so he's got a combine invite he probably gets drafted he was a solid producer from day one uh, his freshman dominator rating was 17.6 percent 69th percentile um, his sophomore dominator rating 21.2 percent 59th percentile both pretty good um, he competed with quality running backs they averaged over three and a half stars as high school recruits like the collective like backfield teammates he had some like main guys there like Ricky person Jordan Houston like both solid guys and he was consistently efficient like relative to those guys his yards per carry was 0.9 uh, higher than theirs as a collective which is in the 65th percentile his 10-yard run rate was over 4% higher than theirs, which is an 81st percentile number. And if you account for like the box counts that that he was carrying the ball against, his per carry efficiency was worth 128% 
of the average per carry of the other NC State running backs, which is an 86th percentile number. So really nice. You know, not super high volume, but consistently one of the more efficient guys on the team, if not the most efficient guy on the team. And he's like a passable receiver. He had 48 receptions in college, 56 percentile, so like a little bit above average. He was split out wide like 5% of the time on passing snaps, which is 49th percentile, like barely below average, but that's that's like good enough, you know? It's not like he was never doing it. So I think if he's, if he's going to end up as the RB4, it's because he's well-rounded, doesn't have weaknesses, He's just big enough. He can just catch the ball enough, and he's a good runner. So, you know, really solid guy. Plausibility of Zonovan Knight being RB4. I'll put it at a four. I think guys like him are just a dime a dozen. Like, you got to offer something else. Like, the amount of guys... The NFL's really good at scouting running backs, which is why hashtag running backs don't matter is a thing. Because it's not that running backs don't matter. It's that there are so many guys who are good enough that the difference between them, you know, once we've already selected for the guys who are good enough to be in the NFL, the difference between them is not large. If your, like, main thing is that you're, like, a pretty good runner, so is everybody else. So you got to have something else that's going to separate you, and he really doesn't. Like, he's a decent but not great receiver. He's got decent size but, like, not great. He wasn't super productive in college. I don't know how athletic he is, like, we'll have to see at the Combine, but I don't see people, like, you know, these Twitter scouts, I don't see people clamoring about, like, his speed or, you know, his jump cut ability or anything. Like, I don't know that there's anything special about him to make him earn a starting job, so. But, like, random dudes fall into volume all the time. Like, Alex Collins is a random dude. Thomas Rawls is a random dude. Like, these guys had seasons where they were the starting running back for a team, were productive. The same thing could could happen for him, but that's not really a legitimate argument for, like, why he specifically could be RB4. So, I just think he's got to offer something else. Okay, let's go to RB3. Hop on the randomizer wheel. Fucking hard to do this with my left hand. Okay. Okay. RB3, Sincere McCormick. Okay, Sincere McCormick is an interesting dude in this running back class. I was really excited about him, like, after his freshman year. He is a small guy from, I think, Conference USA. He played at uh, University of Texas San Antonio, the Roadrunners. He's 5'9", 205, so he's short also, you know, shorter than Verdell. Actually, that's taller than Verdell. 5'9", is greater than 5'8". So he's slightly taller, a little bit smaller than Verdell. But, you know, decently built nonetheless. He's got, like, you know, Giovanni Bernard is that size. Chase Edmonds is that size. Uh, James White, you know, these these kind of guys. So we've seen that these guys can, like, make an impact in the NFL. The rest of the case, I think, for Sincere McCormick is that he's also an early declare. He broke out early, like, early on. Immediately, he was the best player on the team at UTSA. and pro- Maybe the best running back in the conference, in Conference USA. Yeah, his dominator rating as a freshman was over 30%, right there with guys like Devin Singletary, like LaDainian Tomlinson. Chris Johnson, Ahmad Bradshaw, Marlon Mack, Ryan Matthews, like all those dudes broke out early, 30% dominator ratings as freshmen at like group of five conferences. So he's right there with a lot of the best like small school running backs we've seen come out. And he was consistently productive. He had at least a 67th percentile dominator rating every season he played. So it's not like he fell off. And even though he's small, he proved he can handle a large workload. I think the argument about like small guys can't do it is kind of bullshit. But if that's a question you have, he answered it. He had 725 carries in college. That's 88th percentile, more carries than anybody else in the class. So small guy, heavy workload, three years. Yeah, I mean, there's guys in this class who played four or five seasons and don't have as many carries as he had in three years. He had lots of carries and lots of carries per season. Like the dude was handling lots of work. He had positive efficiency in college. His yards per carry was 0.6 greater than other guys on his team. His 10 yard run rate was more than theirs as well. And he was really good in the open field. His breakaway conversion rate, which is like how often, if you just look at his 10-yard runs, how often is he turning those into runs of 20 yards or more, was 33%, so a third of them, which is in the 62nd percentile. So he's a pretty good open field runner, and I think he has like sneaky three-down ability. He wasn't like used a lot as a pass catcher, but like relative to how often they were throwing the ball, his his target share was only like 7% or something, which is in like the 25th percentile. But he caught 66 balls in college, that's 77th percentile. His catch rate was 80 87%, which is also in the 87th percentile. So he like he's, he doesn't have a problem with his hands. And he was split out wide 9% of the time, which is a 60th percentile number. Like he wasn't just catching dump offs and stuff. They were lining him up out wide, lining him up in the slot. On those like actual routes that he's taking from like wide receiver positions, he's catching the ball at almost a 90% rate. Like the dude can catch. So wasn't used a lot there. 
but I don't think like he's incapable. So efficient runner, sneaky three down ability, proved he can handle a workload, very productive. I think that is the case for Sincere McCormick being a top five guy in this class. Do I think it's plausible? Not really. I'll give it a four. And the reason for that is even though he was more efficient than his teammates, I don't think he was efficient enough. Those guys at UTSA are just not very good. Like they average 2.6 stars as high school recruits. That's a 25th percentile number. And his yards per carry, his 10 yard run rate relative to his teammates are like 50th percentile, 40th percentile numbers. If you're like in the 50th percentile relative to teammates in the 25th percentile, you're probably not that good. Like we want to see our guys like absolutely smash relative to their weak teammates. You know, like Chris Johnson was out doing his, his teammates at East Carolina by like two yards a carry. Same thing with Rashad Penny at San Diego State. He was barely outdoing, he meaning McCormick, was barely outdoing these guys by like half a yard a carry. So we'd like to see him be a little bit more efficient. Um, he was also doing that while seeing box counts that were lighter than theirs. The average box count he saw was 0.12 defenders lighter than the average box count that every other UTSA running back was running against, which doesn't sound like much, but relative to like other relative box counts, I guess, that's really low. That's a 19th percentile number. So people were not stacking the box against him, even though he was like productive. He was like the man at UTSA. Defenses were not respecting him in that way. And I don't think he was good enough as a receiver. If you're small, you better be a really good receiver if you're going to like see work in the NFL because guys who aren't big enough and aren't good enough pass catchers like even if you're a great runner which I don't think he is but even if he was I don't think he's a good enough receiver to get work yards per reception 26th percentile yards per target 54th percentile target share 36th percentile just like not quite good enough he's fine not good enough to get on the field in the NFL. The other part of that is like, if you're a guy from a small conference, like a, a small school and you're the best player on the team, your team like damn well better be trying to get you the ball. Like no matter how they can, like a dude like Jay Ajayi is not a great receiver, but at Boise state, his target share was like 13%, like double what sincere McCormick's was. Boise state was just absolutely feeding him. And sincere McCormick, that was, that was not the case for him. Like they were content to just let him run the ball, not worry about getting him touches in the passing game. That's not really a great sign that like he's this super dominant small school guy who's like under the radar, but going to be good in the NFL. Like his team wasn't even trying to scheme him ways to get the ball as much as you would like to see. Yeah, I'll give it a four. It's a good player, fun player in college. Probably not somebody I'm, I'm looking out for in the NFL. Okay, RB2. Let's see what the randomizer has for us at RB2. Oh, fuck. Okay. Brian Robinson is our RB2. Uh, this one's kind of tough because I think Brian Robinson is not good, but the case for Brian Robinson being RB2 in the 2022 running back class. Number one, he's a big dude. He's like 6'1", 225. That puts him in the range of guys like David Johnson, Todd Gurley, uh, like Jay Ajayi. I just talked about him. He's also right there. He looks like a classic, like prototypical, like three down workhorse, 6'1", 225. He was a top tier recruit. Um, he was the eighth Eighth highest rated guy running back in the 2017 recruiting class. Four stars. Obviously, he went to Alabama, so, you know, you got to be good to go there. He did take five years. He's, he's a fifth-year senior. He spent five years at Alabama. Never had a huge role. He was kind of a backup, like, committee guy for those first four years. But he became a starter in 2021 and was really productive. Um, he had 1,600 yards from scrimmage, 35 receptions, 16 touchdowns, dominator rating at 24%, which is just in the 47th percentile for a fifth-year guy, but most fifth-year guys aren't playing at Alabama. Like, nobody has a high dominator rating at Alabama, unless they're, like, Derrick Henry. So, Josh Jacobs didn't, Damian Harris didn't, Eddie Lacy didn't really, so. You guys celebrating in there? What are you doing? <laughs> 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 right around 50th percentile dominator rating as a guy at Alabama. Not bad. And like, even though it took him so long to like become the starter, he was sitting behind some really good guys like Damian Harris, Josh Jacobs, Najee Harris. These are all like legitimate NFL players. And if, even if he's like, you know, the third or fourth best running back at Alabama, that might still mean that he's a top 20, 30 running back in the country. So, you know, maybe it's not that big of a deal that he, that it took him a while. Like he stuck around before he got his shot. What else we got? He's a solid receiver. He was split out wide, like 9% of the time. That's a 58th percentile number. Um, his average depth of target was 
positive. Like most running backs, you know, their average target is like behind the line of scrimmage, catching a screen or whatever. His was 0.4 yards down the field, 55th percentile. And he was pretty efficient on those targets. Like he was 7.3 yards per target, 70th percentile. His catch rate, 85%. Oh, he's, he's got decent hands, 83rd percentile. You know, I guess the case for him is he's big. He's got three down ability. You know, he can catch the ball. And despite what seems like a poor, like, production profile, there are legitimate reasons why it might have taken him that long to become the guy. And he was invited to the Senior Bowl, like, NFL personnel guys, like, you know, they like players from Clemson and Georgia and Alabama, like, these super big programs. Like, I think they're willing to give those guys a shot more than they would be if, you know, Brian Robinson went to Wake Forest and, like, took how long you know, took as long as he did. They're going to see, you know, he went to Alabama, he got the best coaching, played with really good players. They're going to feel like he's pro ready. So I could see him stepping into a role as like a starting running back. Um, How plausible do I think it is that he is the RB2? We're looking back three years from now, Brian Robinson, RB2. I think not plausible at all. I'll give it like a two. I think he could be a starter. I don't think he'll be a good one. Number one, he's old. The average uh, declare at running back is like 22 and a half years old. He's going to be almost 23 and a half, so he's old. And really, like, I gave him a, a, you know, a lot of leeway for, like, how long it took him at Alabama, but he was only really ever good when he was older and, like, more developed, like, physically than everybody else was. Like, he was never more efficient than his teammates as, like, a part-time player his first four years. He was never productive his first four years. It took him until he was a fifth-year senior, more experienced, like, bigger, badder than everybody else until he was even, like, a pot making a positive impact on the field. So, and he was not efficient relative to the other guys on his team, like throughout his career. He averaged 0.73 yards per carry less than other Alabama runners, 18th percentile. His 10 yard run rate was 2% lower than theirs, 22nd percentile. He was bad in the open field, like a third percentile breakaway conversion rate. And if you look at like the box counts he was running against relative to the other guys on the team, the average Brian Robinson carry was worth 82% of the output of any other like rolling tide running back, which is the second worst number I've ever seen and like in the third percentile. So all of that happening while he's like not a full-time player, seeing lighter box counts, he's just not good. Like he's, he's kind of bad. So I think the odds that he's the RB2 are very, very minimal. Okay, so let's see what the randomizer has for us at RB1 in the 2022 running back class. Okay, RB1, randomizer RB1 is Tyler Algier out of BYU. This one's actually kind of interesting. Algier's kind of a fun guy. He's like 5'11", 220. So he's like a big dude, rocked up, same size as like David Montgomery, like LaDainian Tomlinson was right around that size. Rashad Penny's that size. And I actually think Tyler Algier is kind of a similar player to Rashad Penny. The case for Algier at, at RB1 is it took him three years to break out at BYU. He like played linebacker part of the time. I don't know why they had him doing that. Uh, he spent like one year is sort of just like a backup, not doing much um, on the offense. In 2020 and 2021, he was a starting running back. He had a combined like 3,100 scrimmage yards, 36 touchdowns, 42 receptions, and his dominator rating this last season in 2021 was 35.9%, which is in the 84th percentile for guys in their fourth season in college. So kind of had a slow start, but like once he got the job, like he was pretty dominant. He's also a solid receiver. So he's like a big dude. And he can catch the ball. 10% target share, which is a 61st percentile number. Uh, 11.2 yards after the catch per reception, which is in the 77th percentile. So he's like getting out in the open and then just, you know, trucking dudes. He's like a train in the open field. Yards per target, 7 in the 61st percentile. And I know PFF likes him as a pass blocker. His grade is like a 61 overall, like, pass blocking grades, so that's pretty nice. The biggest thing about him is he was, like, ridiculously efficient as a runner. His career yards per carry is two yards greater than other guys at BYU, which is a 93rd percentile number. Like, that's ridiculously good. And his breakaway conversion rate was 35.7%, 92nd percentile. So, get this guy in the open field, like, whether it's on a, a swing pass or he's reached the open field on a run and he's he's gone, like he's good. I think actually he self-reported like a 4-4 four, four flat in the 40-yard dash. I don't know how legitimate that is, but like <laughs> regardless of how he's doing it, when he's in the open field, he's like blowing dudes away. So um, he's also one of these like tackle breakers that PFF likes. His yards after contact per attempt is 4.4, which is the best in this running back class. 
And if you account for the boxes he was facing relative to his teammates, the average Algier carry was worth 128% of the per carry output of like all the other guys on the team. So that's an 88th percentile number. So yeah, I think the, the case for Algier at RB1 is pretty simple. Despite taking him, you know, a couple years to like become the guy, he got there was immediately really good, was immediately really efficient as a running back, and he can catch passes. I don't know that he's like elite in that area, but he can at least play on all three downs. Like he's not going to, you know, fuck it up. So how plausible do I think that is? I will give it a six. I would, I'm not going to like predict it. Like I don't think it's likely, but if in three years he's the RB1, I will not be incredibly shocked. The main questions I have about him are like, number one, why did it take him three years? I don't really have an answer for that. I don't know why he was playing linebacker. The other guys, like the running backs that he was playing behind, were not very good. It's not like there's a guy I can point to like, yeah, that guy was an eventual NFL player. Like these dudes were kind of scrubs that he was playing behind. So who knows? Maybe the coaches were just idiots having him play defense. Maybe he, like who, who the fuck knows? It took him three years. I don't know why. Either way, it's not a good look. He His receiving production, he can catch the ball and he was used there like you know, relatively often, but his average depth of target was negative 1.7 yards. So like two yards behind the line of scrimmage is where he's catching his passes. He's not running legitimate routes. He's like exclusively check downs, exclusively screens, which means that his receiving efficiency, like his yards per, what is that? Rece- reception, his yards per reception and his yards per target numbers are like completely fueled by like his really high yak numbers. They're throwing it backwards and then he's running and like trucking a cornerback or something, which is impressive, but like it's impressive as a ball carrier, not as a receiver. The Like I said, the other guys on his team were not very good. Like they averaged 2.3 stars as high school recruits at is in the 20th percentile. So it kind of calls into question like, okay, he was super efficient relative to those guys, but those guys also just like stink. And kind of the main thing would be that his 10-yard run rate over his career was lower than theirs, uh, negative 0.2%, which is a 38th percentile number. If he's some dominant force, like an actually like good, refined, quality runner of the football, why is he not ripping off 10-yard runs, which is kind of indicative of like, how is he navigating the line of scrimmage? How is he like manipulating linebackers to even reach the second level? Why why is he doing those things worse than the other guys on his team? And the fact that his breakaway conversion rate is so high and his 10-yard run rate is so low is like, okay, he's not reaching the secondary as often as his teammates are. But once he's there, he's incredible. So that kind of calls into a question, okay, his yards per carry is ridiculously high. Maybe that's like almost entirely fueled by like his open field ability and he's not actually a good runner where he's doing, you know, where a running back is going to see the most action like near the line of scrimmage. That's kind of one thing that I've noticed um, just kind of anecdotally and like analyzing these guys is people like Jeremy McNichols, like Kenneth Dixon, Darrington Evans, like Raquel Armstead. These are all like fairly small school guys who also had high yards per carry, high breakaway conversion rates low 10 yard run rates and they ended up like flaming out in the NFL and you don't want a guy who's just dominating because he's like more athletic than everybody else when he gets to the NFL he's not going to be as athletic relative to everyone else and if he doesn't actually have like the nuance and you know refined skill required to run the football in the NFL his athleticism isn't going to mean as much so that would be uh kind of my my hesitation with Algier I think he's like a big fast dude who is, you know, good out in the open. I don't know how good he is as far as like actual skill as a running back. So that would be my hesitation. Don't think it's crazy that he would be RB1, not predicting it. Uh, The randomizer, our (laughs) top five running backs, according to the randomizer, CJ Verdell, Zonovan Knight, Sincere McCormick, Brian Robinson, Tyler Algier. A terrible top five. This was kind of fun for me. I don't know if you guys liked it or not. Um, If you don't, I have another video coming out on Wednesday. So like go watch a cartoon or something and wait for the regularly scheduled programming later in the week. But yeah, kind of fun. See y'all later.